So once we've trained a machine learning model that we want to use in healthcare, we need to firstly make sure that it performs well, and secondly, make sure that it has a clinical impact. And it's worth pointing out that those don't, they're not necessarily the same thing. Um, you can have a model that does really well at what you want it to do, but actually when you apply it to a clinical setting, it doesn't necessarily have the impact that you thought it might have. And there is a risk even that it can have a negative health impact. So in this video, I'm going to talk about how you can quantify the performance of a machine learning model. And then in the next video, I'm gonna talk about how to assess the clinical impact of a machine learning model in healthcare. So there are various different ways that you can quantify the performance of machine learning models, and these aren't specific to machine learning. So we have a lot of uh, performance metrics that we use in statistics, things like sensitivity, specificity, false positive rate, true positive rates, and things that you may well have heard of. But there are some terms that are specific to machine learning, and there are some terms that we use more often, and that's what I wanted to dive into in today's video. The performance metrics that you use will depend on the type of task. So for example, if you have a classification task, there's one set of metrics, and if you have a regression task, then there's another set of metrics. And I mentioned this in a previous video, but but essentially classification is when you're trying to predict what the category is. So for example, you have some chest x-rays and you want to say if it's normal or if it has pneumonia on it. Whereas regression is when you're trying to predict a value. So for example, predicting the length of stay or predicting someone's life expectancy. Now the majority of interesting machine learning applications are more in this area of classification. So that's what I'm gonna focus on in today's video. And then towards the end, I will also touch on some of the metrics that we use for regression models. So to start with, we have just the fundamental ways in which a classification model can work. So uh, here at the top, we have the true condition, so whether it's positive or negative, uh, and then we have the predicted condition. And if we, um, let's, for simplicity, say we're talking about uh, skin lesions and trying to classify them correctly. So condition positive is that there's a cancerous skin lesion, and negative that is, is that it's not cancerous. So if our model predicts that it's cancerous and it is cancerous, that's a true positive. If it, predict, if it predicts that it's not cancerous and it's not cancerous, that's a true negative. And then there's two types of errors that the model can make. The first is a type 1 error, which is where we say that there is a cancer, but actually there's not. And then secondly, there's a type 2 error, where we say that there's not a cancer when actually there is. And in certain settings, we might have a preference for one type of error versus another. And actually, by changing the threshold within our model, we're able to uh, lean more towards a model that makes type 1 errors or towards a model that makes type 2 errors. So let's say, for example, we're running a screening program and we're trying to screen, let's say, breast cancer, um, and we have these mammograms and we're analyzing them. We would much rather that we have type 1 errors than type 2 errors. And the reason for that is because if somebody uh, has this screen and they didn't actually have cancer, but it said that they did, and then we went on to have a second test, then hopefully it would get picked up further down the line as we go through these different tests that would show actually they didn't have cancer after all. Whereas if we had the opposite, where they did actually have cancer and we predicted it as not being cancer, that person could get missed. They might not have another um, mammogram for many years and ultimately the, the cancer could progress and it could be much more serious. So often in medicine, we will optimize for having a, a lower rate of type two errors. Uh, and this is something called optimizing for sensitivity. And we'll talk a little bit more about sensitivity in a little bit. But these are the four basic elements of any sort of classification task. How much our model's predictions align with the reality. So obviously we want the most true positives and the most true negatives that we can. But then on top of these, you have a number of other metrics. And obviously there's quite a few here. I think we don't need to get too bogged down in some of these, but I do find this overall table is quite a useful reference when you're trying to kind of read these papers and understand the metric. There's a couple that we probably will be familiar with. Um, if you're from a medical background, then often we're taught about things like sensitivity and specificity. And so we have a pretty good intuition around that. And then accuracy as well is just the overall performance of the model. Uh, you may also be familiar with positive predictive value and negative predictive value, but there's a couple of metrics here which are more specific to machine learning or just the terminology is a bit different and we use slightly different terminology in machine learning. And the ones that I want to point out are recall is the first one, which is a common metric in machine learning. And essentially it's exactly the same as sensitivity. So this uh, I'll, I'll explain this in a bit more detail in a later slide, but it's how, um, how much are we picking up? So in a population with uh, 100 people of which 10 have a disease, uh, how good are we at picking up all of those 10? If we pick up all 10, we have a, a sensitivity of 100%. If we pick up nine, then our sensitivity is 90%, for example. And then another popular metric that we see in machine learning is precision. It's not the same as specificity, although it is similar. So with precision, we're saying of all the ones that we predicted to be positive, how many of them truly were positive? If we're predicting positive, how precise are we? So let's say that there are uh, 100 people and we predict that 11 of them have cancer. How many of them actually are cancer? Maybe only nine of them are really cancer, in which case the precision is nine over 11. So this is another useful metric. And commonly we combine the two. So we will be interested both in recall and precision. And the way that we can combine those is in a score called the F1 score. And the reason that we like to use the F1 score is because similar with specificity and sensitivity, there's this trade-off in terms of recall and precision. Because 
as we optimize for one, the performance on the other one will decrease uh, as we change that threshold. And I'll give an example of that in a moment. Um, but the thing with the F1 score is that it balances both of those scores. So we want to make sure we're doing well both in precision and in recall. And one of the reasons that it's important to include both of the metrics is if we look at recall and precision, they are actually measuring different axes. So here, we are only looking within conditions that are positive, and here we are only looking within conditions that have been predicted as positive by our model. And that can be problematic to only look at one because it doesn't tell you the whole story. For example, let's say we're looking at sensitivity and we have 100 people and we have 10 that have cancer and our model says that 100% of people have cancer. In that case, the sensitivity would actually be 100% because it has picked up all the correct cancers. But it's also said that 90 other people have cancer. So it's not a useful model. It's just predicting that everybody has cancer. And then if we look at precision, uh, let's say there was 100 people of which 10 had cancer and we predicted one of them and we were really good at predicting that one, then the score for precision would be 100% because we're predicting that one every single time. But actually, we're then saying that 99 don't have cancer and that's not particularly helpful as a model. So it's important to kind of look at both of these perspectives because you want to be able to perform well on both. Because in that case, if we have 100 people and we're only predicting one of them and there's nine that have cancer that we're not picking up, then our sensitivity would be really low. Our recall would be really low. So it is a trade-off between precision and recall and we want a model that does well on both. And that's where the F1 score comes in because it's a composite of both of these scores. So it enables us to give more of a balanced picture. There's another metric that's important to consider and that's called the area under the ROC curve or the AUC for short. And you'll probably see this if you read machine learning in healthcare papers, you'll see the AUCs quite a lot. And the AUC again, is looking deliberately at both of these axes, the vertical axis and the horizontal axis that we saw. And what it's also doing is it's looking at it at different thresholds. And that's what makes the AUC really useful as a performance metric is because it gives us a numerical value based on all these different thresholds. And to kind of explain what I mean by that, let's just go into an example and kind of walk through it. So. I'm going to use this useful diagram uh, from the internet, uh, which you can get at this link at the top here. We have this curve on the left, which is called the ROC curve. Um, and as we move our threshold, you'll see the red dot moving along on this curve. And basically the idea is that as we change our threshold, the ratio of the true positive rate uh, on the y-axis to the false positive rate changes. On this um, curve on the bottom here, on these two curves, so the blue are ones that are truly not cancerous and the red are the ones that are truly cancerous if we're using cancer in our example. And this is us changing the threshold based on the score of the model. So let's say um, here the model has 100% confidence that it's cancerous. Here it has 0% confidence that it's cancerous. So for these examples, it will say I'm, I'm kind of confident with 0%, i.e. that I really don't think it's cancer. Um, and as we move along, then we're setting the threshold. So uh, maybe when we get to here, this might be 50%. And if we set the threshold at 50%, then all of the ones to the right will be classified by our model as cancerous and all the ones to the left will be classified as not cancerous. Now, obviously we can see because there's an overlap in the um, graphs here that actually our model's not performing perfectly. Um, and some of the ones that aren't cancerous, i.e. the blue ones would be classified as cancerous. And some of the ones that are cancerous, i.e. the red ones would be classified as not cancerous. And so we can see that if we move this threshold, let's say we move down to here and we set it at about 0.25%, then now our true positive rate is really good because the true positive rate is all of the red that's to the right of our curve. Whereas the false positive rate is the amount of blue on the right of our curve. So here we've got really good true positive rates and that's why we're at the top here, which corresponds to a high true positive rate. Whereas our false positive rate is not fantastic because actually half of this we're misclassifying. We're saying that it's cancerous when it's not. So that corresponds to about 50% on the true positive, false positive rates. Um, but it's a trade-off because as we increase our threshold, we're going to misclassify some of the true positives, but we're also going to misclassify fewer of the false positives. And if we had a situation where our model is absolutely perfect, then what we'd expect to see is that these graphs move so far away that maybe there's no overlap. And then if our thing can come in the middle, I mean, this actually won't let me do it. Um, this only goes as far as here. But if you imagine that the curves don't overlap and we put our uh, threshold in the middle, it's a perfect model and it's going to get 100%. But that's what this kind of shows at different thresholds. So the idea is that with this model, we want to understand how well does it do all the way across the spectrum. And that's where this ROC curve part comes in, because basically what the ROC curve does is it plots all of these points on a graph for all of these different thresholds as you go along, this trade-off between true positive rate and false positive rate. And as you can see, as the, true positive, as the false positive rate here decreases, the true positive rate then starts to decrease as well. But the line that this red dot forms is the ROC curve. And then the AUC, which is the area under the curve, is basically this whole area 
underneath this curve that we're drawing. And so the distance that this curve is away from this line here, which would basically just be a random guess, uh, the distance of that is then the how well the model performs. And so you can see as we shift these towards each other and there's a greater overlap, it's not that far away from this middle line, which means basically it's not performing particularly well. And actually here, if there's perfect overlap, we're getting this here. And as you can see, our model, it can't discriminate. So it's just going to be guessing every time and it's going to get like a 50-50 chance of getting true positive or it's going to have a 50-50 chance of getting uh, cancerous or not cancerous, no matter what the uh, threshold is set at. But then as our model gets better and better at discriminating and it's better able to separate these points based on the parameters fed into the model, then you'll see this curve start to go higher up and then we'll start to get better and better curves. So down here, the score would be 0.5. So the AUC would be equal to 0.5. Um, up to here it'd be around 0 0.7, 0 0.8 and then as you get all the way up to here it's going to get closer and closer to 1. Um, and 1 would be like absolutely perfect score. Uh, typically that would be quite suspicious if we're getting an absolute perfect score in a machine learning, uh, in, in a healthcare context because it tends to be quite complicated. Um, but if we're getting scores of like 0 0.8, 0 0.9 above then actually it shows that our model is pretty good at discriminating across all different thresholds. And so again what's nice about the AUC is that we're looking at the different thresholds and we're still looking at this trade-off of performance of basically uh, recall versus specificity. Now I know that's not necessarily easy to get your head around straight away. It definitely took me quite a while to actually really understand what was going on. Um, I would recommend maybe pausing and rewatching this video or find some other videos and just see how different people are explaining it and try and find an explanation that makes sense to you. And there is also a really fantastic blog post that I would recommend um, by someone called Luke Oakden Rayner, uh, which I'll just show on the screen here and I'll leave a link in the description below. But he kind of goes into the intuition behind what the performance metric shows and why you need to consider multiple performance metrics. And I think if you read and understand that blog post, you're in a really good position to then be looking at machine learning papers and models and trying to interpret exactly like how good their performance really is. And I think the best approach is to, once you have an idea of what these sort of metrics are, is just to read papers, see what they're reporting and try and understand their metrics. And that way you're kind of building up a picture of uh, what sort of metrics are being used, how they applied and what sort of performance does it show. So those are all metrics that were used for classification tasks. Now, as I mentioned, we have this whole other realm of tasks, which is regression. And there are different metrics that we use in regression. We talked about regression in one of the earlier videos in this series. And basically, uh, with a regression model, rather than trying to quantify how well they're classifying in one class or another, you're looking at how close were the predictions to what the final predictions were. Because we have a model, as I said, it's taking inputs and it's giving you outputs. So how close are those outputs to reality? And one of the most common metrics that we use is something called the root mean squared error. And essentially, it involves looking at the difference between our predictions and what actually is the case, squaring those, summing those all up, and that's a metric that represents the overall performance of our model. There are other metrics that are used, such as the R squared score and the mean absolute error. I'm not gonna go into them in detail here, but if you do want to understand how to apply them, then I'll leave links in the description below, um, and they would definitely also be useful to understand. And a really great resource I would also recommend for learning about these kind of metrics is the Towards Data Science publication, uh, which is published on Medium. And basically, if you just search for Towards Data Science and then the performance metric that you want to understand, there'll be some sort of blog post, or there'll be multiple different blog posts that just explain it in different ways and it's just a case of finding the explanation that kind of makes sense clicks in your head um, and then making notes on that and uh, you know applying that when you then look at papers that are using these sorts of models but as I said at the start uh, it's important not just to have a good performance metric, it's important also to quantify the performance in a clinical setting, because at the end of the day, we want to use these models to improve people's, people's health and the decisions that we make in a clinical setting. And that's where the next stage of things comes in, which is assessing the clinical impact. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in the next video. 